My name is Neely Lakani from the Indo-American Arts Council. We are a 21-year-old cultural organization centered in New York City and are dedicated to promoting artistic endeavors in the performing, visual, and literary arts that are inspired by the Indian experience. I'd like to welcome you to this year's 2021 Literary Festival, where we provide authors and writers to share such stories. This year, our festival runs from December 4th to December 12th, and we invite you to join in our great book selection and be part of the conversation. This evening's book discussion is How to Find What You're Not Looking For, written by award-winning author Vera Hiranandani. Vera is the author of several novels for young people, including the Phoebe G. Green series, The Whole Story of Half a Girl, and of course, the Newbery Honor winning The Night Diary. She's earned her MFA in fiction writing at Sarah Lawrence. Her most novel, How to Find What You're Not Looking For, is about how middle schooler Ariel Goldberg's life changes when her big sister elopes following the 1967 Loving versus Virginia ruling. She's forced to grapple with both her family's prejudice and the anti-Semitism she experiences as she defines her own beliefs. The historical fiction novel has received star reviews from the School Library Journal, from Kirkus Reviews, Publishers Weekly, Your Library Guild Selection, and was named a 2021 Best, Child Best Children's Book of the Year by Amazon, Brightly, and Imagination Soup. Vera, the Indo-American Council, um, welcomes you. Thank you. That was such a lovely introduction, and I'm so glad to be here. I wish we were in person, but this is this is you know the best we can do right now, and I'm I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much. Um, this evening's session is Namrata Tripathi, who serves as the vice president and publisher at Kokila, a new imprint at Penguin Young Readers, dedicated to centering stories from the margins. Prior to launching Kokila, uh, Namrata edited many critically acclaimed award-winning and best-selling books, including Vera's The Night Diary, which was a new very honor award winner. So um, thank you so much, Namrata, for moderating and welcome you to open the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neely. And Vera, it is so good to see you. Yes. Um, I wish we could be together as well, but we did manage that once during this pandemic, and that was such a highlight for me. I think it was my first author in-person meeting, and it was to celebrate your beautiful book. <laughs> um, so as we get started, day. it was a beautiful that day. day. <laughs> mm -hmm. That yeah. memory will have to sustain us now for one more full year. Yeah. Um, so let's start here. How are you in these times with everything that's going on? Um, how are you doing? I am doing okay. Um, things are a little better at the moment. <laughs> um, that's all we can really know. Um, you know, my kids are back in school and all of that. So, you know, I've had more time to focus on work and writing. Um, and, you know, we really edited through the pandemic, um, this book, How to Find What You're Not Looking For. So we really kind of push through some of the hardest times during the pandemic, which I'll always sort of associate the book for better or for worse in, in that way. Um, but we here we are. So it's it's kind of a triumphant place to be at this moment. <laughs> it is triumphant. Congratulations. <laughs> it's a beautiful book. Um, have your rituals changed at all in your, your writing rituals? I mean, it's funny as your editor now, I'm like, tell me about when you're writing and how much and how it's going. Uh, I think this is meant to be. <laughs> right, exactly. This is this is kind of a unique conversation because we're so, you know, entrenched in in the work that we do. We're we're so linked that way um, in the books that in certainly in how to find what you're not talking what you're not talking about how to find what you're not looking for the night diary. Um, so it's very different uh, than any other kind of conversation I would have with another author or another moderator. Um, so we're just sort of like the team in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but um, my writing rituals, um, they've gotten sort of back to, you know, since both of my kids, I have a daughter in college and a son in high school and, um, and and then my husband sort of rented an office. We were working at home for a really long time. So now I'm, mu I'm much more on a rhythm. Uh, the pandemic was very much for so many people. It was like whenever 
you had a moment and things weren't, you know, kind of happening at the home. It was just really pretty wild. Um, so, so yeah, I feel like I write more in the mornings now, which is what I like to do. Um, so I don't know if it's changed in that way. It's sort of getting back to some new normal, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's amazing that in the midst of all of this, you were able to produce this incredible book. Um, so, because I'm uh, not sure that everyone who's watching now has been um, has had the chance yet to read it, maybe you could tell us in a couple of lines a little bit uh, about how you like to talk about the book, or if there's any anything that wasn't covered in the an introduction. Sure. Um, so the book is about an 11 year old girl named Arielle Goldberg who is growing up in 1967. Um, her parents run a Jewish bakery in a small town in Connecticut. Um, with a very, the town has a very, you know, very small Jewish community. And, um, and so we, we kind of open on the novel where Ariel's older sister falls in love with an Indian college student and they decide to get married. And this really changes the way Ariel thinks about everything because her parents are against the marriage. Um, and, you know, really upset that their daughter made this choice. And um, Leah, Ariel's sister, Raj, um, his family is not in favor of the marriage either. Um, but we really see the story through Ariel's eyes and that family were, were sort of more closely focused on that family. And this is all happening right after the Loving versus Virginia Supreme Court ruling that bans all laws against interracial marriage. And so Ariel is suddenly, you know, she's sort of never really had to question who she is in these kind of bigger ideas of religion and race and kind of where what her connections with her her country and her world at that moment and sort of watching her parents make this decision um, where she's met Raj and she really likes him and she sees that they're so in love and she just doesn't understand why why this would be a problem. And so she really has to understand her own identity in a different way. Um, Raj and his family sort of, you know, bringing that into her world and then figure out why her parents feel the way they do and sort of feeling like angry at them, um, wondering if they're, what their prejudice means. Um, at the same time, she's, you know, part of a very small Jewish community. She's the only Jewish girl in her classroom. She has a bully saying anti-Semitic things to her. So she knows what that, what a prejudice feels like in that sense. Um, and so it's really trying to, um, you know, connect that moment where you just suddenly feel like your world isn't just about sort of your little family kind of going through their routines. Um, and this is inspired by my own parents' marriage. They got married in 1968 in Connecticut. My mother's um, Jewish American, Ashkenazi, white, and my grew up in India. Um, he's Hindu, he came here, and they fell in love and and eloped. Um, and my my father's parents weren't living at the time. His brothers and sisters were not they were disappointed. They wanted him to marry somebody Indian and Hindu. Um, but my my mother's parents, my grandparents, um, were very upset about the decision at first. Um, and my mother decided to was willing to sort of um, accept that they accept that they didn't accept the marriage and and marry my father. Um, over many years, they sort of all, you know, my, my Jewish grandparents evolved and, and ended up loving my father. And I grew up very close to my, my Jewish grandparents. And so everybody had to kind of evolve. And my parents sort of pushed everybody to do that. Um, but it was a, it was a really complicated journey. So you and I um, were talking many years ago. And I think we were talking about the the Loving versus Virginia ruling. I think you, I don't know why it had been brought up in the conversation. I don't know if you remember. Mm -hmm. um, and, and thinking about the timing, I had never quite thought about the fact that my parents got married in 1968 in Connecticut, where it was legal for them to get married, which is just kind of a really strange thing to even say. But if they wanted to get married in a state like Virginia, for example, before um, before the, the ruling, what would they have done? Would they have left the state? Would they have not gotten married? 
Um, and it just sort of, it's, it's hard to wrap my head around the idea of my parents' marriage being, being considered illegal in any way. Um, and so I try to shape a story around that, that idea and think of what lens I wanted to tell it through. And I, and so Ariel, Ariel was kind of born in my mind. In that way. I mean, you've done such an amazing job with both this book and then also um, the night diary where you kind of took from your own family story and kind of woven history and made it really deeply personal. But I'm guessing the kind of research you did for the night diary versus how to find is so different. Even the conversations you must have had with your own family about um, about their experiences. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I think I was more intimidated by um, the attempting to write the night diary because um, it's just such a huge piece of our, our global history. And um, I just you know, sort of kind of like little old me taking on this history, even though I have a direct connection, my father is a partition survivor. Um, you know, could I, what, what lens did I want to put on it? Could I, could I attempt to shape that story? And I had to do more intensive research and talk to many partition survivors, many different families, Hindu families, um, Sikh families, Muslim families, um, and hear so many different kinds of stories to, to completely fill in the question that I was trying, that I was asking of just like, what would it feel like as an ordinary family? What would it feel like, you know, my father's family had to do this um, and leave their home. And so for this book, you know, the, some of the research that I was doing was just sort of a little specific in the sense of researching the late sixties, that information in this country, that information is not hard to find. And so I was just really making sure that I had all my ducks in a row of what was happening in the timeline of the story in 1967, um, right after the Loving versus Virginia ruling and during the civil rights movement. And this is also the, the novel goes um, across where, you know, Dr. King is needed and the protests that happened um, around that. And so I just had to keep looking at how this family would react. And so that certainly started with asking my mother and, um, you know, what she remembered during that time and how she absorbed it and and how my father absorbed it and the decision they were making. So I could really ask them um, those specific questions, because, again, you know, I was I was still asking the question, um, you know, all these huge things are happening historically. But how does this ordinary family living their lives react to, to everything? And how, what does it feel like to go through this time and this experience? And that's always what to ask as I write the story um, and just really get into the characters' heads with the information, with the research that I've done, both in a personal way. Um, you know, my in-laws also grew, they're Jewish and they, um, and they grew up in Brooklyn and in the New York area all during the 60s. So I could also ask them, um, you know, how they absorbed all the things going on and, and being Jewish in their communities. Um, my father-in-law's father, so my, my husband's grandfather um, ran a bakery in the Bronx. So I, that was great it's just as far as like, research there. Um, and then just other family members and friends who who went who lived through that time, um, both on the Indian side of my family and the Jewish side of my family. Yeah. Yeah, so I that. think I mean you mentioned this in in, in you're speaking now about how you really thought about uh, how were individual families and individual people affected by sort of big political moments, and I think that's just something. You always do so well. I think, you know, when I talk about you in house and at Penguin and present your books, I kind of say like that is your superpower is to take um, big political mov moments and movements and render them so personal so that you feel like the earthquake of that time. Um, and I think you you get that here. Um, now, I think one of the things you do really well, too, is because you're doing this thing about really focusing on the emotional impact of a historical moment, there's obviously a resonance with what's happening in the present day. Like, for example, when we worked on The Night Diary, which is about partition, you know, that was the largest human migration in the history of the world. And there's also a giant um, global migration crisis. 
and refugee crisis. And it was a, it was a way to really humanize the present day by talking about this moment in the past. And, um, and here also, I feel like um, when I read How to Find, I really thought about a couple of things that you did so, so beautiful. I wonder if you like do this intentionally, if it's what the reader brings to it, because we're all trying to process and make sense of our own world around us, which is what fiction is so useful for. Um, but because Ari is, you know, looking at um, being like a single, you know, like a young girl, when you can tell that the world is kind of going through this major shift, there's a sort of tectonic shift happening in the United States with the civil rights movement, with Dr. King's assassination, of course, loving the Virginia ruling. Um, and yet she's trying to figure out parents showing this prejudice towards Raj. Why are they against the marriage when they themselves purport to have different beliefs? And it's sort of that moment of sort of recognizing, do we live our values? Do we practice our values rather than just, just speak them? And I think it's something so many people were going through here. I mean, definitely after, um, you know, the, not this past election, the previous one, um, there was, I think, a real moment of sort of political upheaval in the United States. A lot of people sort of, there was a lot of um, political divides even within families. And there were so many questions about how do I talk to family members who have very different beliefs than what I think is truly right at my, at my core. And it was kind of that, you know, how am I going to go home to Thanksgiving and have this conversation with someone I'm supposed to be close to and love? And here, Ari is dealing with just that, having these intimate conversations that are really fraught over the dinner table with her parents. Or um, I think now as we live in a pandemic too, how do you process as a single person, especially as a kid, as a kid reading this, um, that something very big is happening in the world and you feel maybe powerless in that mm -hmm. moment. I mean, I think when we started writing it, there was one kind of um, political moment we were sort of responding to. As you continued writing it through the pandemic, there's something we didn't expect at all. Were you thinking about all of these things and trying to tie them together? Is, does it just naturally make its way in? Yeah, I mean, it. certainly I don't know what's going to be happening in the, in the present moment, right, when I'm writing. And um, things just keep happening. So um, I do think about it a lot. And I don't know if I'm making those connections more intentionally or they're just kind of happening. Uh, I mean, maybe I would be what I what I mean by that is no matter what was happening, would I be looking for ways to connect? the my present experience to the past you know th this right here the pandemic times everything is shifting and changing and we're sort of working from our homes and our family life and kind of bringing ourselves like in every moment so th that has changed and um and when i was kind of editing this book you know george floyd was murdered and there were protests and all this racial um, inequality, which is always obviously been there, just, you know, kind of right at the surface, everybody having to face it in different ways. And then, of course, different people reacting in different ways. So there were there were times while I was writing this book where I would maybe watch people react, whether it was friends or family members in a different way that I was reacting or that my family was reacting and kind of trying to figure that out and reconcile it. Um, the other thing that I was feeling was, you know, Ariel is because she's going through a time that she's watching her parents struggle in a way that she's never ha had to watch before, um, where they're really second guessing everything that they do. They're kind of falling apart because as, as much, you know, they feel like it's the right thing for them to do at first to sort of reject Leah from the family in mm -hmm. hopes to have her make a different decision. Um, but when she doesn't, and I don't want to like sort of spoil the, the book, um, they suddenly have to realize what they might lose, which was very similar to what happened with my own grandparents, you know, that they, they made this decision at first, um, 
my grandfather, you know, he had to leave Poland um, because of pogroms in Poland attacking Jews. And he left before the Holocaust. But I don't want to think about what would have happened if he hadn't left when he did. Um, my grandmother has a Russian background and was born, but was born in, in the U.S. Um, but that's what, you know, particularly my grandfather was and my grandmother, but that's what they were holding. And so that's their their Jewish identity felt like, you know, they had to sort of hold on to it in a way that, you know, was really connected to kind of their lives being threatened and they were sort of willing to hold on to it even because it, that's how important it was to them. And it only became more important over the years. So to have, you know, my mom or Leah in the book um, kind of seem like they're rejecting that um, was was really, really hard for them to to wrap their heads around. So Ariel is watching her parents try to do that. Um, and then at the same time, you know, feel the the questioning and the grief that they're feeling about the decisions that they're making. And she has to see her parents as real people, as flawed, real people. And, you know, I was thinking about in the pandemic with my kids and, you know, all of us living together and my kids sort of seeing me at times, like really not sure what to do, what was going to happen, um, what all of this meant. Um, and at times where I just couldn't be like this sort of solid, stable parent for them because I was sort of just like losing it at the same time. Um, I think a lot of parents, you know, had to kind of reconcile with that of sort of showing their kids more of kind of the messy world than and we ever wanted to really do. It's, you know, um, and so Ariel's kind of facing that and seeing her parents as people and and also having then when you when you have that moment as a child, you have to decide what you think. You can't really rely on your parents anymore because maybe you disagree with them. And then maybe you have to just look at the, the data you have and then decide who you are um, and what you believe. And that is really the moment I, I was trying to capture with Ariel, which was completely separate of, you know, I wasn't trying to tell my parents story. I was certainly bringing that in. And that was the way it connected to me. But then Ariel isn't really she's Ariel, you know, she is a fictional um, character that's just embodying a lot of things. But then it's just, I really love trying to see these, these sort of difficult, um, you know, very sort of consequential moments in history through a young person's eyes, because they're just coming at it, certainly from an innocent place, but also in some ways where they are just first contemplating some of these ideas. And I think that's really an interesting place to to sort of explore as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting. We haven't talked about this so much before, but I think it's such a a part of what children's literature does in general. Or I often think about kids' books as a, a gift and a tool you give to a young reader. And this book certainly is both. And beyond the sort of grappling with this historical moment, is that aspect of recognizing your parents humanity and how flawed they are kind of in tandem you know and what a what a shocking moment that can be for a young person because it's really critical in many ways that your parents can remain um sort of there's no fault lines visible because that's what gives you a sense of security it's sort of what orders your day uh if you're if you're lucky if you have a, a parent you know who's sort of supportive and a, and a rock there for you and to kind of see that emerge I think can be so tricky but like it's so one of the things that I think is really useful in the book that it does is so in addition uh, to Ariel kind of navigating um, her parents sort of prejudice or slowly coming around to what the kinds of decisions they're making about Leon and Raj and what that means on a lot on a larger scale about um, acceptance and something that they've really wanted to um, teach her is also that she's she's navigating um, some difficulty in school, right? And and it's not necessarily stated as such because it wouldn't have been such at the time, but um, she's sort of an informal dysgraphia diagnosis mm -hmm. by a teacher, a young teacher who's sort of learning the new science. And, and Ariel sort of does a thing where she finds new allies and other adults outside of her sort of parental circle mm -hmm. who can support and encourage her. And I think that's such a, an important moment in a 
young person's life, when the scope of your influence sort of broadens and you start to look outside of your home also for the people who are going to shape your life and who may be allies to you when you most need them. And I think what's great is that that's modeled really beautifully here that you see that there can be hopefully safe adults who will um, help get you to that next stage of your life. And this one teacher really is sort of critical and a breakthrough for her in expressing herself and sort of finding herself as a poet and learning to communicate in the way that she feels um, most able to in writing at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that's absolutely right. Just sort of that, that when you kind of have that moment where maybe you're, you know, you're realizing your parents are flawed and more hu human than you thought. And then you kind of need, you start to seek out different um, support systems, which is part of getting older and like advocating for yourself and just becoming an independent human being. And some of it might be more intentional and some of it might be just kind of the happy accidents of, you know, having a, a teacher who may see you in a different way than your parents do and you and you like the way that they see you and that is an empowering thing that's happening so she is feeling um kind of more seen in a way from her teacher um because you know often kids with learning differences you know especially in the 60s um and my mom was a special ed teacher so she um kind of helped me you know shared some of her experiences it, it was you know the understanding was you know, we're talking how many years back, um, that many years back, because I can't do math on the spot, <laughs> whatever years back in the 60s, um, where it was often like, just try harder, um, don't be lazy, pay attention more. And, and that nuanced understanding of all different kinds of learners, um, it just wasn't there. But, but so Ariel just happens to be, you know, her teacher happens to be particularly interested in looking at whatever the brand new research was about uh, dysgraphia, particularly. Um, and then, you know, Ariel feels relieved, like, oh, you know, because sometimes, sometimes labels aren't good, but sometimes labels can be really empowering because you're just sort of like kind of, you know, trying to make your way through something, feeling like you're disappointing people because you're not... Mm -hmm trying hard enough when you're trying so hard, maybe more than the average kid in your class and you're still not, you know, sort of hitting your, your stride. And so um, she really, she really helps Ariel find the tools she needs to express herself in the way that she deserves um, to be able to. I think as so. a, as a, um, one of the things that I love about middle grade is that it can really be read it's so beautifully read in tandem between generations, especially The Night Diary, I really think is an intergenerational novel and family should read it together. And my daughter is just getting to the age where we're gonna read it together now because I think we can have those complex conversations about partition. Um, but here too, with how to find, I mean, you could read it together or an adult could read it or a child could read it. And I feel like a child might get out of it that sense of understanding that there will be there will be allies you will find in different fields, you know, aspects of your life. But as a grown up, I think it's a really nice reminder that like you might be the kid, you might be the grown up that a kid desperately needs mm -hmm. and to sort of listen fully and see them in a way that sometimes the, 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 especially with our family or the people closest to us, we sometimes sort of assign narratives to them that we've grown up with. And it's very difficult to see outside of that. And I think like in a way, Ariel's such a perfect person to capture this whole thing about what it means to see someone fully because she is dealing with sort of on a larger societal scale questions of prejudice. But she's also right. navigating a very um, uh, personal experience of it, right? What it means to be seen as someone who's not trying hard enough and sort of that kid who is not sort of as sharp as the other kids and being labeled in a way that's really damaging, which is not her at all. And really finding someone who can see her and help unlock that piece of her is so critical and what a what a lovely reminder to all of us as adults that that's a power that you have and it can be so transformative in a kid's yeah. life. Yeah. Um, were you gonna say something more? Well, I was just thinking about, you know, tools and that idea of tools and like the typewriter for Ariel becomes a tool. And so, you know, part of it is, I just feel that we don't sort of look enough at our, kids as you know as individuals who who just need the right tools because you know I felt that growing up I felt like 
I wasn't the perfect student. Um, I, you know, sometimes had attention issues. I was really great at the the subjects I was interested in and not so great in the other subjects I was um, interested in. My handwriting isn't great. I had to wear, you know, a um, you know a rubber thing on my pencil does like hold my pencil right. And when I um, transferred over to typing, I learned typing in high school. I kind of never looked back. I looked, I used a word processor and then I draft everything on my laptop. Um, I, I really, you know, handwriting isn't my favorite. And my son also has, he has dysgraphia. And so, you know, watching him use the laptop as a, a tool has been really just a wonderful thing. So I, I always think about what, as adults, you know, what, because we know more what tools are available. Um, and that was something I felt strongly about showing. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit and just talk about the stylistic approach in this novel, because I think it's really um, unique and something that we have to get into a little bit, which is that um, here you decided to use the second person. So yes. can you talk about your decision to do that? Yes. Well, part of it was, you know, that I've just always really loved the point of view. Um, and when I was studying writing in graduate school, you know, I was reading adult writers who were using it. Um, and I was just sort of fascinated by the way that it kind of, you know, links arms with the reader and it's, it's just sort of joins the reader and the main character in a way where you, you just kind of have to join up and sort of be the same person. And it's a really interesting effect. It also gives this effect of kind of giving instructions, you know, because if you read an instruction manual, it's in second person. It's like, well, first you, you know, pour the flour into the bowl, then you stir, you know, and so it, it's sort of an ironic thing of like giving instructions when you don't know what you're doing and you're just trying to figure out your life. And so there's that like little irony about it too. Um, and I actually tried it with my first novel and it, it didn't really work. And I wasn't kind of, the novel wasn't the right novel and I wasn't sort of ready to do it. Um, and so this, this novel, I wanted to try again. I thought, you know, this is a really specific character, a, a Jewish girl growing up in 1967 whose older sister is falling in love with an Indian college student and, you know, the, the general setting and space that they're in that maybe some people would really relate to and some people wouldn't at all. And what and if you're a young person um, and you don't really sort of have that much in common with Ariel, well, you're, you're Ariel and you're sort of going to walk in her shoes um, and experience the world in maybe a more intimate way than you would in another point of view. And it just somehow you certainly help make it work for the tone and the, and the style of the, the novel. And, and also I'm just grateful that you were sort of trusted me to kind of experiment in that way. Of course, so did, you, you felt. did you want to share a little bit of the, um, maybe a little bit of the novel now so people can get a kind of taste of that second person? Yes. Voice? Yes. And then I'm always curious of what it was on the editorial side. Oh my goodness. We can talk about <laughs> Um, but I'll just read a couple of pages from the very beginning so you can kind of hear how the second person is working. So um, I'll read the title to the chapter, How to Be the Lazy One. It's harder than you think. First, lie on your messy bed wearing your Wonder Woman pajamas that are too small because you've had them since you were nine. Then watch your older sister, Leah, pin up her hair for dance class. She sits in her black leotard at the small white vanity, her back straight as a board, a magazine cut out of Paul Newman taped to the corner of her mirror. She uses at least 15 bobby pins for her bun. Count in your head while she sticks the pins in. One, two, three. She's rushing because she has to be on the number four bus by 9 a.m. for point class at Madame Duchamp's Dance Academy. She dances there every day except Sunday. You're not even sure how she spends so much time at dance and still does well in school. Leah seems to do well at everything. Not you. You're the lazy one. You're just trying to keep up. But along with all the other things Lee does, she helps you keep up. She helps you keep up. Four, five, six. Ma wishes Leah didn't take dance on Saturdays because of Shabbos. But Leah says it makes no sense for her not to dance if Ma and Daddy work all day at Gertie's, their bakery. Then Ma says Leah's right, 
and maybe they should be more observant and not work on Saturdays. Daddy says the bakery wouldn't survive if they closed on Saturday in this town, and that's more important. They argue about the rules like that sometimes, how Jewish you're all supposed to be. Seven, eight, nine. On pin 10, Leah suddenly stops and puts her hands over her face. Her shoulders start to shake. You lean forward in your bed, confused to get a closer look. Leah hardly ever cries. You're the crier. It's the only way anyone pays attention to you. You cry when you're sad or mad or when you watch Lassie. Sometimes you even cry when you're extra happy. You get it from daddy. He's a crier too. Leah manages to keep a smile on her face most of the time. If she's upset, she gets serious and walks away, her shoulders straight, her head held high. But today, on a warm Saturday in early June, as the sun tumbles through the window and the birds chirp and the smell of Ma's Sanka flows through the bottom of the door, Leah sobs into her hands and it terrifies you. Leah, you say, jumping out of bed and over to her side, don't cry, what's the trouble? She turns to you, she picks up a tissue off the vanity, presses it to her eyes, then blows her nose. If I tell you a secret, will you promise to keep it forever, she says? Forever? Yes, forever, she says. It's the biggest secret I've ever had, and if you don't think you can promise, I won't say it. Keeping a secret is not your favorite thing to do. Secrets make your stomach hurt. You can count on one hand the secrets you've kept. You once took a report card out of the mailbox and hid it in your school bag for a week, but you got caught. Sometimes when you hang out with your friend Jane, you make it seem like you have other friends, but you don't. Occasionally, you steal cookies from Gertie's and keep them in a coffee can in your room. You've never had to keep a really big secret before, certainly not forever. Leah's cheeks get blotchy, and her eyes start to fill again with tears. Oh, please, she says, I have to tell someone, and I need it to be you. Leah saying she needs you? Is there anything more special than that? Maybe if you know her secret, Some of her specialness will spill over onto you. She bites her lip and grabs your hand. Okay, you say, taking a deep breath. I promise. Yeah, I love that. Vera, it's it's so wonderful to hear it in your voice. Like, I got shivers. Like, you know when you get the head tingles? Um, Especially when you get to the line where she says, you know, you're the lazy one. Or uh, you're, you're lazy or you're the crier. I mean, there's something in the second person that's so beautifully, you know, we didn't talk about this piece, but like that so beautifully um, reinforces like the vulnerability of the character because it shows how the way she like internalizes what other people say about her. And because it's framed in second person as a reader, you feel it. You feel that thing of this thing is imposed on me. You're the crier, you're the lazy one. And it hurts. You really feel the pain of it. Um, You were gonna say something. Yeah, no, how vulnerable she is to what, you know, how vulnerable kids are to what the grownups tell them who they are, you know, when when you're young. And and then often people just start those things at a certain point. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I love in working with you as a writer is that you often seem to set up a stylistic or f- like a formal uh, limit mm-hmm. or structure that will be a challenge to you, right? So like in the night diary, you're like, I'm gonna make this an epistolary novel. And so everything has to work in these sort of letters written in a diary from a girl to her mother, to her you know deceased mother. And here to write in second person, I mean, it really does in a way corral how far you can kind of spread out. So your creativity has to sort of expand in unexpected directions. Yes. Was, it expands was, and then, yeah, it expands and then it hits, you know, the limits of the, yeah. what I've imposed, which is kind of what I'm trying to do for myself. What were you going to say? You no, know, I was going to say like, you know, what were the kind of unique challenges of writing this particular novel? And I'm, I'm assuming a lot of them had to do with the, the stylistic sort of limits you put on it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I started to, once I got the hang of it, as far as second person, you know, it became so familiar to me, and it becomes more of a first person narrator. That's kind of what I 
sort of hope the effect will be, you know, maybe a young reader will pick it up and be like, oh, I, this is different. Maybe they're not even sure why it's different. Um, and then it just becomes, you know, you're, you're sort of one with the main character and it becomes more like first person. Um, but there were times where, I don't know, it felt like I was repeating the you more. There were things maybe you pointed out, you, <laughs> um, pointed out, you know, where something just felt like awkward or, you know, too repetitive. I mean, we were always just kind of tinkering with that a little bit. I don't remember what you, you know, in the beginning of the novel, what you were sort of thinking and trying, hoping I would gently encouraging me to achieve. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it was um, such an interesting challenge you set up, but I had every faith that you'd be able to do it. It was really a question of being like, how do we get it to work line by line? I think really early on, but it's a weird choice, right? It's unusual. There's very few novels in second person. And to kind of say like, okay, will, will a reader stick with us? Will they understand what we're trying to do? And I think pretty early on, we kind of came to the agreement that globally across the novel, it worked well. But really, does it work on every page? Does it work in every line and not get to a place where you're like, this feels awkward. This feels forced in this moment. This voice is clearly... Uh, you know, you're shoe, you know, shoehorning it in, which is a, a thing that happens in first and third person too for different reasons, right? Um, and I think one, I remember one of the things we talked about was how effective it became the choice that you made to then title every chapter with yeah. a kind of how to, right. because it unified the novel across, you know, from from start to finish. And it reminded the reader, you know, if they left off somewhere and then came back to the book four days later, say. Right. That you're like, oh, right, how to, it already tells you, like, this is second person. It kind of just primes your mind to perceive a story in that manner again, which I think was really, really important. Because I think if you read the whole way through, you feel like, oh, yeah, I understand the kind of um, contract I've made with this novel in this moment. And you just go with it. When you pause, it, you have to kind of reacclimate. Yes. Yes. And that was, yeah, when we came to that, that really helped frame the novel because we were working on that sort of continuity and that, you know, kind of smoothness um, throughout the novel and, and hoping it would, it would flow that way. Yeah. So, um, so thank you. Yeah. And <laughs> one of the things that, that I love that you always seem to do in your books too, is talk about food and make yeah. everyone hungry. And in this book, um, there's the presence of a lot of different kinds of, a lot of food, but especially cookies and black and white cookies, which um, you just sent me a tin of, which my daughter and I are very much enjoying right now. I would actually love to be eating one at this moment. Um, <laughs> and so um, maybe talk a little bit about like what the relationship of food is in your writing. Yeah, I, I do just love food. <laughs> I love eating food. I enjoy cooking food um, when I have the time, not always with a family uh, in a pandemic, but, you know, some people really cooked a lot during those times. Um, I was like, oh my gosh, again, another meal again. Um, but I do really love cooking. But I think for me in writing, you know, one thing when I was younger and I would read books that had focused more on food and, and describing the food that the characters ate, somehow I was able to remember those books more vividly than like any other books. One of the books I remember so well are Bread and Jam for Francis. And there's so much food described in that book. Um, and she only wants to eat bread and jam, but you know, all the other characters are eating all kinds of things. And so I was like fascinated but um, also for me, I think it's, you know, having two cultures in my family and two food cultures in my family. So there are these two, you know, traditional foods, of course, there's just like everyday foods and it's all a big mix. But, you know, growing up with, you know, traditional chicken matzo ball soup on one day and, or one holiday and then samosas on another, um, you know, are, are my some of my favorite comfort foods. And it helped me sometimes connect to both sides of my family through food because I felt really familiar and the food just felt really intimate and close to me where sometimes I felt different from my cousins on both sides of my family because they had two Jewish parents or two Hindu parents and they had different customs or practices that I my parents didn't do with us. Um, so the food uh, was always a comfort for me. And, and then, yeah, I really enjoy writing about it. And I love when people give me feedback like that. 
you know, that they enjoy it and it made them hungry. So, mm -hmm. so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is, this is always sort of the occupational hazard of being your editor. <laughs> Be yes. always hungry. Um, and then maybe before we wrap up, you could tell us a little bit about what you're working on next. Well, yes. Um, <laughs> what we're working on next, I would say. Um, so we're working on uh, a sequel to The Night Diary, um, which is really exciting to return to this world and these characters. Um, we're following them actually from uh, Mumbai, then Bombay, um, where they've kind of come from Jodhpur and and are trying to rebuild their their lives. And so often when you write a book about a huge um, kind of global crisis or some kind of any kind of crisis, you know, often it's the survivor story. And I, I did that with the with the Night Diary. And, and that you know, we see that a lot. Um, and I wanted to do that with the Night Diary. But then how do we after after people survive, what happens? You know, how do they carry that with them? How do they rebuild their lives? What kind of trauma do they have to sort of figure out? And then who are they, the strengths and weaknesses that sort of happen in that in that future? So that's what we're looking at in the in the sequel. And I'm really excited about it. I'm so excited too. And I know you have a lot of readers who are eagerly awaiting it. So we better get back to work <laughs> on that novel. Um, yeah. And I think with that, I'll invite Neely back to um, sort of sign us off. This was such a wonderful time. It was just, so, it's always so good to talk to you, Vera. And I feel like, I mean, we worked on the book together over years, but every time we chat, I feel like I still learn something new. And it's just like such a pleasure. Well, me too, me too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Namrata. Thank you so much, Vera. Um, and that was such a great discussion. I mean, The Night Diary is one of my favorite books that I've read with my kids. Um, when my seven-year-old is ready, it's 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 one of those uh, books that I have actually right in her shelf that I plan that we are going to go through this together. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to take this moment to congratulate you. Um, right after Thanksgiving, New York Times published this beautiful article on your book. Um, I, if you allow me, I'd love to read you know, just a little snippet of it. Um, what's most striking about the book is how kind it is. People learn, forgive, try to do better. In a knee-jerk time, it's powerful to witness Ari's realization that people can grow and change, that her parents' prejudices are grounded in their own youth as well as historical Jewish trauma, that even her bully, who's def definitely a jerk, has a story. None of this makes bullying or prejudice okay but it makes it easier to call people in rather than out. Um, that's, that's straight from the New York Times. Um, thank you so much for being part of today's discussion. Thank you so much for bringing how to find what you're not looking for to, to our audience um, on behalf of the entire Indo-American Arts Council. Thank you again, Namrata. Thank you, Vera. And um, I'd like to close out the session. All right. Thank Thanks you. so much for having us.